Hi everyone, thanks for watching. Today I want to talk about how you can improve the quality of your life if you identify as a highly sensitive person or a very empathetic person or an empath. So I'll start by saying that there are a lot of great things that go along with being a highly sensitive person, like being very observant and intuitive and thoughtful and compassionate and, you know, and be empathetic, conscientious, loyal, creative, all kinds of good stuff. But there are some drawbacks too, right? And many people end up coming to find that they are highly sensitive or em very empathetic through some suffering that makes them really look into why it's harder for them in certain situations than others. So I definitely used to identify as an extremely highly sensitive person or empath, and I still have many of the traits, but no longer to the extreme. So I always thought of it, even before when it made me suffer a lot, as a good thing, but the reality is that that neural patterning was causing me a lot of emotional upset and a lot of stress. Um, and therefore it was harming my health. So when it came to recovering my own health, I knew this was one of the patterns that I needed to shift in myself. And I was successful in doing that. So I'll tell you first what it was like before, and then I'll tell you about how I changed that and a little bit about how it is now. So I used to come home crying after work sometimes when I was working with a particularly sick patient because I would just feel their pain so much in myself. And if somebody was describing a trauma or a really stressful experience in their life, I would feel that stress or some kind of trauma reaction occurring in my body. I also felt like I absorbed other people's energies when in their presence, even if we weren't interacting, just felt like even being in the room with somebody who was in a really bad state, put me in a bad state. Um, I would also get really stressed or upset during emotional or violent movie scenes or when watching the news. And I took it really personally when people would treat me without the utmost kindness, respect, and positivity, when there was rudeness or something like that, or criticism as well, it was really, really hard for me to swallow. And after things like this would trigger me into a state of stress or emotional upset, it would often take me hours or occasionally days to come back into that calm healing state called rest, digest, and heal or safe and social. And so that is why when I really started to reflect on this pattern, I realized it was a big layer in my physical health as well as my mental and emotional health. So let's talk about how I broke that pattern. Well, it started with looking at this patterning I had from a totally different perspective, right? And that is the perspective that we have in neuroplasticity which is that your brain can change. So however those neurons are wired up right now, doesn't mean they have to remain wired that way. And so in the context of what we're talking about here, being highly sensitive person or empathic, I'm making some assumptions here, but I think what I achieved is actually altering the connections and activity levels of mirror neurons and some of those parts of the brain that are really involved in being very aware of my surroundings, especially aware of the state of other people, of their nervous systems, of their emotions, et cetera. So if you haven't heard about mirror neurons before, mirror neurons allow us to learn through imitation of somebody else's actions and behavior. So we watch them do something and then we learn how to do it. Monkey see, monkey do. Mirror neurons also seem to help us intuit a person's intentions behind what they're doing. And so that doesn't mean we're always right, but if you have very robust mirror neuron networks, you're probably better at that. 
mirror neurons also allow us to experience what we imagine other people are feeling, both emotionally and physically. And we do that inside ourselves by replicating it, right? So this is not a process of, I absorbed that from him or from her. This is a process of your brains made some deductions about what that person was likely experiencing based on what you have experienced in your own life. And then it reproduced that inside of you. So have you ever watched somebody get physically hurt and instantly felt a pain or discomfort in your body, right? That was this process. Have you ever watched a movie where somebody's crying and you start tearing up? That's mirror neurons. So mirror neurons activate when we empathize with other people and empathy scores in studies are higher in those who have greater activation in the mirror neuron networks. Um, and so that's how we know they are really important in empathy. So when somebody is smiling, our mirror neurons that relate to the activity of smiling actually activate and we're more likely to smile too. And depending on how robustly our mirror neuron networks activate, we are more or less likely to mirror not only the body language or facial expression of somebody else, but also their emotional experience. So we know that there are some biological bases for the difference in people's mirror neuron network. So you know, stronger mirror neuron responses have been found in studies in biological females than in biological males when processing emotional facial expressions of other people's, both when they are focused on the other person's emotional state and when focused on their own emotional state in the interaction. That being said, as we've talked about already briefly, we can actually change the networking of our brain. So if that networking of the mirror neurons is really robust and overactive and it's causing actually a lot of suffering for us when we're in contact with other people, their emotions, their behaviors that may not align with how we would like to be treated, et cetera, we actually have some control over this, which is, I think, so exciting if you are a person like this. So I'll tell you a little bit about what's like for me now. So after having done this neural retraining on this particular issue, I can now be in the presence of somebody who's going through something really hard emotionally, physically, somebody who's really sick, somebody who's in a lot of pain, any of those things. And my nervous system remains calm. I know many of you out there have been conditioned like I was to think that the most supportive we can be to others who are in emotional pain is when we quote, feel their pain or we take it on with them. And while this does show somebody else that you're emotionally attuned to them, I would argue that it's absolutely not the best response to help that person move through the emotional reaction and back to safe and social. If you're lost in the same emotional turmoil as they are, how can you help them out of that? Understanding their pain is different from feeling their pain. And you don't have to feel it in order to understand it. And you don't have to feel it in order to be supportive and hold space and be kind and loving and compassionate. So um, I just wanted to bring that up in case that is the belief system that you have been operating under. I've definitely been in situations with clients or patients way in the past now where I was getting so emotionally dysregulated by whatever it was that they were struggling with, that it was hard for me to um, be a help to them. So I like to give this example of moms and babies, because when it comes to emotional attunement, that's a really important place for that to occur, right? We know that um, mom's level of attunement to babies' emotions and needs 
um, sets a precedent for the attachment style of that baby and how their nervous system is going to develop. But can you imagine if we mimicked how the baby felt all the time and what impact that would have on the baby, right? What if you started bawling every time the baby cried or you had a panic attack every time your child was afraid? You know, babies and children are especially hardwired to pick up our emotional and nervous system state and mirror it. So this would just reinforce the baby's distress, right? And it does the same in adults. In those moments, the other distressed person needs to feel safe. And you remaining in that safe and social nervous system state is the best way to help them with that. Okay, so back to how do you actually rewire this? So this is similar to rewiring any other neural habit that your brain may have, any other programming that you may have developed in life, or even that you may have a propensity to through the way that you developed your genetics, whatever. The way the neurons are wired together can be changed. So what I did is I started by looking back on my life and I said, okay, what kinds of experiences have I had, especially as a child, that made me think this was the appropriate response to have to somebody else having an emotional reaction? Or where might I have learned that it would be rude to not be overly empathetic? Did I see my parents modeling this behavior of being overly empathetic, overly sensitive, taking other people's emotions on, trying to solve their emotions for them, et cetera, et cetera. And so I searched for those kind of neurological roots for how my brain may have learned this behavior in the first place. And then secondarily, when you have experiences like that in life, oftentimes belief systems come out of them. So I started looking for beliefs that may be fueling this pattern, right? Things like they're going to think I'm rude if I don't look upset while they're upset, or <clears throat> I can't help but get emotional when I see somebody on TV get emotional or uh, everyone would get upset at watching this news story or I can't change it. It's just who I am. I can't handle other people's emotions, all those kinds of things. And one way you can kind of try to figure out what your beliefs are is you can ask yourself, well, when other people are having emotions or they're stressed or they're, you know, being rude to me or um, they're criticizing me, what does that mean to me? What does that mean about me? What does that mean about life? What does that mean about them? Those kinds of questions can really help you hone in on those belief systems that are um, fueling a pattern like this. And you can also use the memories that came up as a guide as well. You can go, okay, well, as a child who went through this particular thing, what might that have led me to believe, right? So the memories and belief systems that come out of that internal inquiry can be rewired. And we teach you how to do this in the Wired for Wellness program. And we actually have guided processes that lead you through rewiring a memory or changing a belief in the program. So you can get it done nice and easily and usually very, very fast. And when you do that, you basically dissipate a lot of the neurological roots for this pattern, right? Where it came from. And that is a huge win. It takes a lot of the backing that your subconscious had for continuing to run this program and just deletes it. And so 
already just from doing that, you will probably have less of this going on inside yourself. But then the third thing to do after that is to really change the neurological habit. So you had the original roots that triggered why this became a pattern for you in the first place, but then the pattern itself, the program that runs neurologically in your brain, you have created a super highway between those neurons from having fired them over and over and over and over for years or decades of your life, right? Anything that fires in the brain over and over again just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And when it gets that strong, it becomes automatic. It becomes something that happens without your conscious control or effort. We also need to start interrupting the habit and teaching the brain to go in a different direction when you're in one of these situations that brings out that overly empathetic side of yourself and would normally cause you to be really dysregulated. So when you're in one of those situations and you notice yourself starting to overreact, as many of those times when it would be appropriate to remove yourself in that moment and go do a process to redirect your brain to do something else, that is ideal. And you can actually do this even when you're not in one of those situations, which we also teach you about in the Wired for Wellness program. So if you even just imagine somebody that you care about or really anybody, if you're that empathetic, you're going to have an emotional reaction to anybody's suffering. So you can just imagine you're sitting in the presence of somebody who's really upset or is really suffering in some way. And just visualizing that in your mind is likely to bring up some of that uh, reaction that you would normally have in that situation in that moment, even though that's not actually happening, right? But if it starts to bring up tension in your body or the feeling of wanting to cry or whatever else it is, once that's happening, that's an opportunity where you can then rewire it. And there are a lot of different ways you could do that. But the essence of it is that you want to teach the brain what you would rather it do instead in that situation with pattern interrupts that do that. And so I'm not going to explain in this video what a pattern interrupt is, but it's a neural retraining technique that forces your brain to do something else entirely. And in this situation, you would want to do something that makes you feel calm, relaxed, grounded, centered, all of those kinds of things that you would naturally associate with a calm nervous system that is in safe and social or rest, digest and heal, whatever nickname you want to give that state. And so those are the three facets of really changing that pattern. And if you want help with that, we are helping many other people do that already in the Wired for Wellness program. And we would love to help you do that too. I can tell you from personal experience that it is so incredibly freeing. And I know for a fact that I'm being of more service to people now than I ever was before when I was running that overly empathetic pattern. But I'm also being kinder to myself in having rewired this because my nervous system and my health are not suffering anymore every time anyone else in my environment. Um, it's clearly not sustainable because suffering is everywhere, right? It can't be avoided. It's part of life. And so the better thing to do is to teach your brain how to remain calm, even in the presence of that suffering in somebody else, so that your health can remain stable and you can be a more help to the other person as well. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please subscribe, like this channel and get on my newsletter for receiving more of these. All right. Thanks so much.